So we're in the last week of our summer series in the uh, the book of Romans. Hopefully you've enjoyed the series and uh, hopefully you've learned quite a bit through this uh, study of Romans. I know that I have. And we uh, last week we looked at dealing with debatable matters as Christians. And those are issues that there's no clear scriptural reference for. And Romans 14, 13 is kind of that key verse we had last week. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. It's a great reminder as Christians, it is a great idea to speak where the Bible speaks and then to be silent where the Bible is silent. But in all of that, we do it in love. And so Paul is wrapping up much of his teaching by putting into practice this idea of love because of and through Jesus. And here's the deal. As you read through this, it would be real easy to stop in chapter 15. It'd be real easy to go, okay, you know, now he's kind of wrapped up. Everything's finished. He's done all his teachings. What good is the rest of chapter 15 and 16 going to do for me? Well, we're going to look at that today. Uh, Romans 15, 7 is kind of his final instruction. He says this, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. And if he kind of just left off the rest of the book, all of us would be like, man, that was really good teaching. Good job, Paul. Excellent book. That was really nice. But he continues on. And as he continues on in these next sections, we actually can learn some lessons From what Paul writes, even though it's not quite as doctrinal as those teachings before, there are some great lessons for us. And Paul is showing us his faithfulness, and he makes sure that we know this, that we know that God's plan is first. That we know God's plan is first. And Paul does this this way. Paul's life shows that his God's plan takes precedence. Romans 15 says this, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus and my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Ithacum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel. Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see and those who have not heard will understand this is why i've often been hindered from coming to you in this in section paul has kind of wrapped up everything he's kind of going to give everybody his plans you see and paul says that is why i have been hindered from coming to you paul had his own plans we all do this we all have our own plans Uh, mike tyson famously said everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face i agree and that's how Paul is here. He had his own plan, but he realized what, realized what mattered most was God's plan. And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But let's start from the beginning of the section and see what kind of a mindset Paul has that allows him to follow even against what he would prefer to do. Verse 18 says, it is what Christ has accomplished through me. Paul understands where the hierarchy of credit starts. God did this, not me. I mean, how often is it that we act like I did this and then I just kind of give God credit. So as long as I look good, I'll give God some credit. You know, God did this. You know, it's like this. I just want to thank God that I am so awesome, that I am the best and so great. My skill level and achievements are so absolutely amazing. Of course, it's because of God. But look how great I am. I mean, maybe that's a little bit of exaggeration, but you've heard stuff like that where people pretend like they're giving glory to God, but they're like, really, this is how good I am. We're not really giving God the credit. It's giving ourselves credit, and God gets the mention, kind of like the assistant director of lighting in a movie. You know, they get that last little line in the uh, in the credits of the movie, and you're always like, I couldn't have done it without him. Well, actually, I probably could have. And Paul's like, no, no. God gets all the credit. I couldn't have done anything without God. He is leading. Paul understands that God gets the credit and that obedience to where God is leading provides godly results. He is just obeying what God said to do. Because I'm sure at some point in Paul's life, he would prefer not to be beaten. Just a guess. He'd probably prefer not to be stoned almost to death. Just a guess. I'm, I'm assuming Paul prefers not to be in jail on a regular basis. There's a lot of things that I imagine Paul would prefer for his life. He would have other ideas, but he obeyed God. And God said, take the message of Jesus to the Gentiles 
And Paul did it, no matter where he had to go. Verse 19, it continues to show how dependent Paul was on God and following his direction. It is through God's power that he was able to do all this. Paul knew God had a plan for him, and the key was to let God lead and to give God the credit. But here's the thing about God. God is not some heartless dictator. God is not a heartless dictator that sends people out to somewhere or to do something that they hate and they're not equipped for. That's not how God operates. You see, God prepares people. Look at verse 20. Paul says it is his ambition to go where Jesus is not known. And that is where God sent him. Paul says, I want to go there. And God says, that's awesome. I want somebody to go there. I'm going to help you along the way and I'm going to go with you. You see, when God creates a direction, he will also create a heart for the mission. When God starts to give you a direction, says God says, go over there. And God's not going to make it where you're like, I don't want to go over there. I hate that. That's not even close to what I'm good at, God. That's not who I am. When God creates a direction, he's going to create a heart so that you want to go in that direction. That's what he did with Paul. Paul wanted to go share with the Gentiles. And God did that for him. You see, God has created each of us different so that he can use us each in different ways for his kingdom. We church planted a long time ago. And and there's a different mentality of people who are church planters versus the mentality of people who are pastors. They're both needed, but a church planter is the type of person that goes out, finds people, gets the church started. But you know what? In a few years, that church planter might not be a very good pastor because they are different. They have different skills. They do different things. Now, a pastor might come in and be able to take the church that the church planter planted and grow it well more than the church planter ever could. And God says that to each of us. He goes, each of us have a different skill. And God knew Paul's heart, his skills, and his desire. And then he used those to further his kingdom. The whole time, Paul was open to do wherever God sent him. So what does that mean for us? Ultimately, isn't that always the question? What does that mean for us? You might think, there's nothing I really want to do like Paul. I'm good with avoiding jail. I don't like to be beaten. Maybe you're thinking, there's nothing that I'm that passionate about in my life. Because Paul was kind of a driven guy, actually. He's really driven. But here's the question that I think will lead you to what God's plan is for you. The question is this. What aches your heart? What aches your heart? Paul's heart ached for those that didn't know Jesus. God used that to send him on a mission. So the question is, what aches your heart? I mean, is it people in our community that don't know God? And I hope that aches all of our hearts. But there may be something specific within that idea that you relate to. Does it ache your heart that there are kids in our community that don't have enough food to eat? Maybe it aches your heart that there are people trying to recover from a life of addiction and they need somebody to help them. Does it ache your heart that their marriage is falling apart and they need somebody to walk hand in hand with them to help them keep it strong? Or maybe does it ache your heart that there are students in our community that are teetering on the edge of faith because of the struggles that they're going through? And I could list all these other things, but the question is, what aches your heart? For Paul, what ached his heart was the Gentiles not knowing Jesus. So if you want to know what God's plan for you is, you just have to think for a second, what aches my heart? Where is God leading me? What is God's plan for my life? Because that very well is probably the plan God has for you. He wants you to do something about whatever it is that breaks your heart. And often we think that we see something and we go, man, that's terrible. You know what? Someone should do something about that. That someone is you. That someone is me. If it breaks my heart, God is telling me it's my responsibility to do something about it. So if that someone is us, and if we feel this way, and we see the need, and it's breaking our heart, what is the next thing that we should do? The next thing we should do is pray. The next thing we should do is pray, because prayer leads us to what God wants, not what we want. And we see that with Paul right here in Romans 15, 30. It says, I urge you, brothers and sisters... By our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there. So that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul did what God led him to do. He didn't do what he wanted and ask God to bless it. I don't know about you, but I've been guilty of that in my life. This is what I want. God, just make that, ha- make that work, all right? I don't care if you want it. That's what I want. 
Uh, maybe you've been in those shoes as well. We do what we want, just ask God to bless it. Now, yes, Paul had a desire to reach people that didn't know God, but he was open to do whatever God wanted. And if we just do what we want for God, then when it gets tough, we think to ourselves, well, God must not be in it, and we'll just quit. But when we're on a mission for God, and every time I say that, I think of the movie The Blues Brothers. We're on a mission from God. And when we're on a mission from God, when we're doing that for Him, then we're not going to stop when it gets difficult. Paul could have quit several times. I probably would have quit after the first three or four beatings. But he didn't. Because he was on a mission from God. You see, they weren't his plans. They were God's plans for his life. One day a man was walking close to a steep cliff and when he lost his footing and he plunged over the side and as he was falling, luckily enough, he was able to grab on to a tree that was sticking out about halfway down the cliff. He managed to get untangled and he found himself hanging from this weak limb with both hands. He looked straight up and he saw the cliff was almost perfectly straight. He was a long ways from the top and he looked down and it was a long, long way down to the rocky bottom. And at this point, the man decided it was time to pray. Yeah, that's what we all do. He didn't pray a long, wordy prayer. This was his prayer. He simply yelled out, God, if you're there, help me. And when about that time, he heard a voice coming from high above that said, I'm here, my son, have no fear. Well, the man was a little startled at first by God's voice, but he pleaded, can you help me? Can you help me? And God replied, yes, I can, my son, but you have to have faith. Do you trust me? The man answered, yes, Lord, I trust you. God said, do you really trust me? The man strained to hold on and reply, yes, Lord, I really trust you. Then God said, this is what I want you to do. Let go of the limb, trust me, and everything will be all right. Well, the man looked down at the rocks below, and he looked up at the steep cliff above him, and he yelled, is anybody else up there? (laughs) And that's what we do. God says, do you trust me? Yeah, yeah, I trust you, God. Then just do my plan. Do what I've asked you to do. And it's like that in our lives. No, that's not my plan. Anybody else up there? I know that what I need to do, even if I say I have faith, but then I'm scared to do it. So what is God's plan for your life? Are you willing to fulfill his mission? And God or God used Paul's natural giftedness, his spiritual gifts, and his desires, and he grew them into a God-sized plan. You see, that only happens when we know what God wants for our life. And how did Paul know what God wanted? Because Paul prayed. Paul prayed. He asked God to lead him. He asked God to take care of him. And he asked others to pray with him. You see, not only praying for leading, but that he could accomplish great things for God. You see, prayer is how we connect to God's direction in our lives. Prayer is how we connect to God's direction in our lives. Prayer isn't just asking for things. It is not just telling God about our lives or thanking Him all the time. It is understanding that we pray to the one that is above all and the creator of all. Throughout the Old Testament, you see over and over again these evil kings that would tell the Israelites, they would say, I want you to bow down and pray to me only. We see Shadrach and Meshach, we see Daniel, we see all these different people. And the kings say, we want you to just pray to me. You know why they want that? It's because it's a sign of submission. And it's an acknowledgement of who is in charge. It is giving credit to someone that is higher than you, and so you pray to them. And when we pray to God, that's what we're doing. We're saying, God, I'm in submission. What is your plan, God? I mean, you know my skills, you know my heart, you know what aches, you, you know my passions, God, and you know what I can accomplish. But with you, man, we can accomplish so much more. I, I want to be in your plan, God. That's what prayer does. And Paul shows that he's giving God credit for everything and he's submissive to him in everything to do anything. And that's what prayer does for us. It connects us to God's will, God's direction, God's power, and it allows us to remember who we are in submission to. You see, God gets the credit and we go where he leads. And now we saw earlier in the text how God led Paul. He was open to wherever he had. Romans 15 says this. Paul says, this is why I've often been hindered from coming to you. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. Not a lot of definitives in Paul's plan. You notice some of these words? He says, I was hindered. I am longing to go there. I plan to do this. I hope to visit you over here. 
Why would he say it that way? Because Paul has his plans, but the only thing that matters is God's plan. And Paul realizes, you know what? I might not be doing exactly what God wants, but if he changes my course, then that's what I will do. Now, God isn't saying make don't make plans. God is not saying live every day like you don't know what's going to happen and just go along. That's not what God's saying. God is saying allow his plans to supersede yours. God is saying, I have a better plan for you. And if you're willing to follow, then you will see things and be a part of things you never know could happen. God is saying to us, just let go of the branch. Just let go of the branch. And I will take care of it. And you will see things that you can never imagine, like Paul is talking about here. He says that in verse 19. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. God's power led him and took care of whatever he needed to be done at every turn. And there are wondrous things that happen when we fully follow God's plan. But it isn't just that easy to say, okay, I'll follow wherever God leads. It's scary. It's hard. I know for me, personally, when I decided that I was going to do what God told me to do, I wanted to do anything but that. I want to do anything but that. We see throughout the Bible, people, God says, go do this. And they're like, that's not what I want to do. Jonah, he decided to run the exact opposite direction. And he ended up living in a whale for three days. Hope that didn't happen to any of you. But he, he, I mean, he decided, I'm not going to do what God says. I'm going to do the exact opposite. And it is scary when we realize this is what God wants us to do. And it's not that easy just saying, okay, whatever you want, God. Because we need help along the way. We're all going to stumble. We're all going to fall. We're all going to get scared. And we're all going to think to ourselves, I cannot keep doing this. We need each other. We need a team around us that can spur us on and that we can do life together with. And that is what Paul leads us right into in chapter 16. He says, here is what I've been doing because of God. And here are some special people that have helped me along the way. Because you see, God will bless us with the right crew for the journey. God will bless us with the right crew for the journey. I love sports. I'm a sports guy. I talk about sports. I coach sports. I I watch sports. I love sports. And sometimes you have a sports team that you just can't do anything with. Well, you know, you can make them better. No, no, not really. They're pretty bad. Well, you know, you coach them up. Well, genetics kind of stops all that. And you think to yourself, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I want to coach this team, and, and this is a you know, team, but you know what? This team's not going to win a game. But see, God wants to win the game. God wants us to reach people. He wants us to change lives, and God is the one that's going to give you the team, and God is going to give you the right team to make a difference and to win. You see, when God is in charge of our journey, He equips us with the right crew, with the right people who encourage us, and we encourage them. God provides the community we need to fulfill his plans. He provides the right team around us. Romans 16 is Paul listing some of the friends and relationships he has had along the way. These are his people that have helped him through difficult times. They are friends, trusted confidants, people he has invested in, and people who have invested in him. And what Paul is describing in Romans 16 is what a life of following God's plan looks like. It has many different relationships developed over time through the commonality of doing what God wants in our life. Now I know what some of you guys might be thinking. I have done what God wants me to do in my life, but I don't know that I have those types of relationships. I don't know that that I have that many that are close relationships, that that are confidants and and that are that are that close. Well you may not want to hear this, but but here's the truth behind that. You get out of relationships what you put into them. I mean, yes, you may get hurt, but if you bottle yourself up and close off, then of course you won't have good relationships. And Paul was an open book about his life. He says, I struggle with this. This is tough. And he invested in the lives of people and he got relationships out of what he put into them. Now, Paul had relationship problems. I mean, Paul's kind of a hothead sometimes and and him and Peter got into it. Peter was supposed to be the one that started the church. And him and Barnabas got into it. And him and John Mark got into it. Paul had relationship problems, but that didn't stop him from building new ones. He didn't say, oh man, that relationship was bad. I'm never going to do that again. Over and over again, we see all these relationships that Paul had because he was doing what God wanted to do and God provided them. So one reason you might not have these types of relationships is that you are unwilling to be an active participant in building your team. 
You might be too scared that you've been hurt before. You've been burned and you're like, man, I'm not doing that. God's plan for your life is well worth getting burned. God's plan for your life is worth a few relationships that might fall apart as long as you're doing what God is leading you to do. And building relationships is scary. But God will put the right team with you for the journey. The second reason might be that we aren't actually doing what God is planning and leading for us to do. Let me explain that. I mean, that doesn't mean that we are rebelling, but simply not following the plan God would want for us. I mean, it's easy to do that. Just live our life day to day, you know, be a good person, you know, follow God, but choose not to take the real journey God has for us. I think that's why so many people say that their Christian life is boring or routine. Of course it is, because you aren't living the full plan God has for you. I mean, here's the reality. When I was young and, and I chose to go into the ministry, I had a couple options. I could have done this or I could have done something else. I've said it before. I love sharks. I could have gone and worked with sharks. I, I love them. You know, and I could have said to God, I'll be a Christian and, you know, and I'll, I'll do this. But I know you're telling me to go be a pastor and do this. But I want to do what I want to do, God. And, and I'll still be a, a good Christian. That'll be fine. And sometimes we do that in life. right? God, I'm following you. You know, I'm not doing anything terrible. I'm not a bad person. But God's been telling you, no, you see this person next door to you? That is your ministry and your heart aches for them. And you're like, nah, I don't think so. And I, I, you know, I'll just be a good person, God. I don't really want to step out. I don't want to let go of that branch, God. That's a little too scary for me. Or God might be saying, you know what? You have this heart for these kids that have no food here in town and you need to do something about that. You're like, that's too big. Uh, there's no way I could do that, God. I don't have the resources. I don't have the people. I, I just couldn't do it. And God says, let go of the branch. And I'll provide my power, my resources. And I'll provide the crew to come around you. So what is God's plan for your life? What is God's plan for your life? You see, when we actively pursue and actively pray, pray for God's plan, He will guide us and we'll begin to see this network of people that we get to be in community with and we get to grow with. I've said this before. But God has a general will for all of us. He all wants all of us to live lives of righteousness. He wants us all to evangelize. He wants us to worship together. But God also has a specific will for each of us. And often people just stay in his general will. And we don't follow the richness of his specific will. Because we're too scared to let go of the branch. We're too scared of what that might look like. And what that might mean for us. So how do we know what that is? How do we know a specific will? Again, what breaks your heart? What skills and experience has God blessed you with? I think we make it harder than it is. Because we realize what it means if we truly follow his specific will for us. I think you can think right now, I bet, and think about a couple of things that break your heart and you're thinking to yourself. I think God wants me to do something about that. I think that's God's plan for me because of the way he's given me gifts in my life. The way he's skilled me, the way he's built the network around me, and the things that I've been through, I think that's what God's plan is for my life. I'm willing to bet you can think of a few things that might be God's plan for you. So what breaks your heart? What is God's will for you? But whenever we do follow God's will, we have these relationships that begin to grow around us. And that's what Paul is seeing here in in chapter 16. And, And before we look at the specific individuals here in 16, I want you to look at who makes up this list. His crew is all different. We have men and women. We have slaves. We have high-ranking people in Caesar's palace. We have everyone in between because that is the church. What God says is, I will build up a church around you to help fulfill my plan. That is what our crew will look like when we are following God's plan. Our team will consist of people that we may have nothing in common with except for our love for God and willingness to do what he wants. I have worked with people in ministry that I really just don't like. I know it's hard to believe. I'm a pastor. It doesn't matter. We're all going the same direction. And this is part of the team. And they probably didn't like me either. But you know what? We were together fulfilling God's plan. And your crew can be all kinds of people. And that's what God is going to do. He's going to provide the right people to accomplish his plan. And we can see the type of unity that Paul is talking about in this group. Because he says, in Christ four times. In the Lord five times. This is chapter 16. He uses family names like a brother and sister a few times and several times calls them my dear friend, which dear friend literally means be loved. These are some serious relationships Paul has in ministry. I mean, you can see the closeness he had with these people. So let's look at them real quick. Romans 16, 1 and 2. He says to you, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincrea. 
I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Now, first, sometimes the church is accused of being misogynistic. But Paul lists nine women here, and they have distinguished themselves in leadership. And the first one is Phoebe. What do we know about her? Here's what we know. She's a deaconess. You know what that is? A female deacon. Very simple. She is a leader in the church that she came from. That meant that she was had an official position as a leader in that church. She is also entrusted to take this important letter to Rome. Paul gave the entire book of Romans that they wrote and gave it to her to give to the church. She obviously probably had some business there and she just took this with her as she went. She must have been someone with financial means because it says Paul. She supported Paul and others. She was a leader and helped grow the church through the gifts God had given her. Paul clearly valued her and her ministry. That was part of his crew, part of Paul's team. Now, here's the thing. If you read through this, and and this may get a little uh, nerdy. I'm going to get a little nerdy on you. Now, we begin to run into some issues with these next names. And I want to briefly discuss this because I think it's important, but I said it's a a little nerdy here. Many of these people listed were part of the Ephesus church. And some people think that this letter was written and they took a piece of a letter that was supposed to go somewhere else and added it onto the end of Romans because they looked through this list of names and they're like, that doesn't make sense. These are, these are people from Ephesus or, or some other places. Why would Paul write to Rome and add all these greetings to these people that are supposed to be in Ephesus? So some people think that. But here's the problem with that. If Paul was writing a letter to Ephesus where he's at for so long, the list would be the size of Romans. It would be so many, because think about this. If you write a letter back to the church and you're Paul the Apostle, you can't leave anybody out. You know what they're going to go is, oh yeah, see what, see what I mean to Paul. He doesn't care about me. You know we all do that. If you're not specifically mentioned, you know when your friends tag everybody but you on Facebook, you're so hurt. <laughs> Same thing. Put it in today's terms. And so if if he was going to write one to Ephesus, he would have to write everybody, and that would be way longer than this list. And the second of all is this. We have to remember that people traveled and moved a lot more frequently than they do now. They would just move city to city and do some stuff. And the reality is, all roads lead to Rome. Literally, you've heard that before, and that's the truth. That's why that phrase, all roads lead to Rome. It was the center of commerce, and it would not be surprising for some of these individuals to move to Rome and be there for a while for business. Or they could have been there intentionally to spread Jesus. Here's another big key that shows us about this. Is that there may have been more Christians and especially Jewish Christians back in Rome. Because in AD 54 Emperor Claudius died. Now this may not mean anything to you and you may not even care. But Emperor Claudius died in AD 54. In AD 49 he expelled all the Jews out of Rome. He said all the Jews have to leave Rome, and so he kicked them all out. When he died, that edict probably died with him. Well, as you can imagine, if if you're a Jewish Roman and you want to go back to Rome, I mean, Rome is the place to be, so they all came back. So what, what happened was, it's amazing how God works, he kicks the Jews out, the Jews go become Christians, and they come back to Rome. Uh, we see this right here in Acts 18.2. There he met a Jew named Aquila, this is Paul, and a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them. So Priscilla and Aquila are probably back home. They probably went back to Rome. So it would not be strange for them and many others who had converted to Christianity to return home. And that explains several of the names, and then many are obviously more Roman, like Aristobulus, who is the grandson of Herod the Great, and was a great friend with Claudius. Also Narcissus, he was a rich, powerful freedman who was a big influence on Claudius. And we don't know if either one of those guys ever became Christians, but obviously some in their household were. And it seems that there were even Christians in the imperial household, in Caesar's palace. So that brings us back to Priscilla and Aquila. They could easily be in Rome doing God's work. Romans 16, 3 4 Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Again, I want you to notice something. Who's listed first? The female, Priscilla. Uh, that, that, that's strange for back then. 
But what that does is it shows how much of a worker she was. She was either the leader in the family by faith, or maybe she was the first one converted, or more than likely she was more of a leader in the church and more of a leader in her servanthood. And that's why she was listed first. But she was a leader in the church. You see, God uses everyone for his plan. They had to leave Rome, and God knew that, because God knows. And then they learned what Christianity, about Christianity, follow Jesus. They go back to Rome and begin to make Christians. You see, God has a plan for all of us. Probably wasn't what they planned. They probably would have preferred to stay at their home. But God knew what he needed from them. Romans 16, 7 says this. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Now, you may not be able to tell, but that's actually a couple. All right, male, female. Probably like, which one's which? Anyway, but that's a married couple. And they were they were great missionaries. And they were considered outstanding among the apostles. Now, that doesn't mean the twelve and Paul. There's a group of apostles that were sent out from the churches to plant churches and to preach. And so it's a little bit larger group. But regardless, the point is, these two people have done some great work. And everybody knows who they are. It would be like, you know, these two people are like, you know, Billy Graham. He does some great stuff. That, that's how this this is. You know, this is that idea. This is, you know, a preacher that everybody has known about and has done great work and everybody approves of them. But just like Paul, each of these people may have had a plan for their life, but they were open to God's plan. And they are part of Paul's crew as he is sharing Jesus and taking the gospel to the world. Now this list is just a small list of some amazing relationships that Paul had because he followed God's plan for his life. So ultimately all this comes back to this. Why does this even matter? Why does it matter? Here's why. Because God has a plan for you. He has a journey in your life just for you. Now, you can choose to play it safe and just kind of live. I mean, that's fine. You you know, be a good Christian. You can go to church. You can be nice. You know, don't kick little kids. You know, you know, help old little ladies across the street. You know, all that stuff. You can be a Christian and not follow God's bigger plan. But I guarantee this. If you choose not to follow God's bigger plan, at some point you're going to be like, this Christian life's kind of boring. I don't, I don't get what everybody's talking about. It's because you're not following the plan God has for you. It's because you're simply just living day to day and just kind of comfortable and you're just hanging on to that branch. And God says, I got a bigger plan for you. You see, or you can decide that you will act on the leadings God has put in your life. What's aching your heart? Then you will step out of that comfort zone and take an incredible journey with God. And we've seen that God will provide all along the way. He will allow us to be used in ways we have never imagined. And he will provide the right crew along the way to help keep us motivated and to help fulfill that call that God has given to us. Let me wrap this all up. Paul sums up with Romans in this. The end of Romans, it says, Romans 16, 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. That is weird stuff. If you read that, and you didn't have to read that more than once, you are much smarter than me. Let me sum it up in English normal language. Here's what he's saying. Paul is saying God can do anything. He's had a plan from the beginning. That plan is Jesus. And he wants everyone to put their faith in him. And that plan includes us living out the incredible journey God has for each and every one of us. That's how he wraps up Romans. It's all about Jesus. It's all about us taking Jesus to the people that don't know Jesus. That's what Romans is all about. And I don't know about you, but I get excited when I think about the incredible plans God has for my life. I get excited when I think about the incredible plans God has for your life. It excites me to think of the things that that we can do as a church, that you can do individually, that we're going to do together with your crew, that are going to change the world around us. It excites me. But the first thing that we have to do before we can begin to start our journey with God is to make God in charge of our lives. We have to make the choice that he's going to be the boss. He's the one that we're going to pray to, and he's the one that we're going to give credit to. And that means that we choose to follow Jesus. And when we do that, our sins are gone and we can be a child of God. Here at Southern Heights, we call that getting on base with God. And the B means to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. A means to admit that I need a Savior, that I'm a sinner. S means I surrender my life and says, God, I'll let go of that branch and I will do whatever you tell me to do. And E 
is to express that in Christian baptism. And you can do that today and to begin your journey in God's plan in your life. But every week, I know there's many here that have already done that. That's awesome. We have homework. So every week we have homework and here's our homework this week. If you've already made this decision, first is this. Pray about God's plan in your life. Pray about it. What is God leading you to do? What is aching your heart? What is it God wants specifically for you to do? And then, after you pray about it, discuss it with someone. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a relative. What is God's specific plan for your life? Maybe you're already doing it, and that's awesome. But I think we sometimes limit what God can do through us because we underestimate his power. And sometimes we think God's plan is only this big, and God's like, no, that's the tip of the plan that I have for you. Trust in my power. Talk to me, and I will lead you to great things for me. We limit God's power too much. You see, God will provide whatever we need to fulfill his call. So discuss it and see where God is leading. Now as a church, we want to be on the front edge of God's call. We want to be on the front edge of where God is leading. So we want to support you as a church. We want to help you. So let us know how we can help and be part of supporting you as we all live out God's plan. Because ultimately, like Paul said, we do this so that all might come to the obedience that comes from faith. Let's pray.